The question is, why is that important? Um, we know it's common, and the more we look at it, the more common it becomes. And obviously, if we don't look at the ventilator, we don't look at the patient a bit, what uh, Nick Hart was saying earlier on, we'll never discover them. But if we find what the literature says is about 23%, up to 93% of patients have one or more patient ventilation asynchrony. And if we divide the number of asynchrony divided by the number of breaths, and if more than 10%, then has got consequences. And the clinical consequences are reduced sleep, prolonged mechanical ventilation, and there is a lot of data showing that, that prolonged intubation and uh, outcome. So these are two studies that I put there, just as a way of um, giving you an idea. There are many more, but essentially, if you look, uh, there is, see what I can get a pointer? Yeah, it looks like that. Uh, can you see the pointer there? It's a bit faint, but essentially you can see that patients have got an asynchrony index, less than 10%. <coughs> That's the length of mechanical ventilation compared to the other ones. And you can see here, these are very much the same in terms of duration of mechanical ventilation, tracheostomy. And although they are small studies, and you can see the p-value is not very different, you would agree that there is a certain difference between the two. Now, what is asynchrony in a way? If we put these things together, now we've got two uh, elements that drive the pressure that is necessary to relieve the elastic and the resistive work of the lung and the chest wall. One is the patient, and the patient has got his own neural rate. So is what the brain says the respiratory frequency should be in terms of inspiratory time and expiratory time. And the ventilator is doing the same, or we, maybe we are doing the same by setting the ventilator with a certain inspiratory time and expiratory time. And then there is a neural intensity per breath. This is the muscular pressure that the patient is developing in order to overcome the, elast the elastic and resistive work and the pressure that is generated by the ventilator. So these two together, when they match, is a perfect match. Otherwise, the next thing we have is a flow asynchrony. Okay, when the two pressures are not uh, matched. We'll talk a little bit more in detail in the next few slides. And when the timing is not correct, then we've got a timing of phase asynchrony. So this is a general overview of what asynchrony might look like. Now, for each phase of breathing, uh, there are different asynchronies. So if we think this idealized breath, uh, we've got an initial, uh, sorry, an initial period, which is the triggering and the inhalation phase. So if you think about the uh, asynchrony related to the trigger, we've got a few of them. We've got some examples. I won't show you any p-value, odds ratio, or anything like that. It's going to be graphs, and just we look at them and we think about what they mean. So auto-trigger, delay trigger, ineffective trigger. So these are the most common asynchronies of all. Uh, double triggering, and I will uh, possibly mention that later on, maybe in the discussion, what reverse triggering might be. And then there is the inhalation. This is the time when the flow, the pressure goes up, so we can have mismatch of flow, so flow asynchronies. Could it be too much or too fast, too little or too slow, or there is insufficient pressurization. And then it becomes the point where from inspiration we go into expiration. This is the uh, cycling off asynchrony or the expiratory trigger. And you can see that could be too early compared to what the patient might want or might be too late. Or if it's too early, it will uh, result into double, tri double triggering. And then we'll see what the effect of intrinsic peak might be into this uh, asynchronies. So if we start with triggering, can I ask you, this is a waveform, what do you think that is? <clears throat> is it normal? Okay, so I would say, do you agree that here there is a reduction in flow? The flow changes here, the pressure goes down, the flow goes up. This is not completely go to zero, therefore is an effective trigger. This is essentially the patient trying to breathe, but is not able to uh, uh, trigger the breath uh, from the ventilator. And here you can see much better. So this is the esophageal pressure. This is a balloon catheter going to the middle of the esophagus. And then essentially any deflection in a negative way means the patient is trying to breathe. But you can see here that the neural rate, so what the patient would like to breathe at the rate of 28, so if you count those, but actually the ventilator is only giving 16. 
And that's because you can see that the flow changes, flow goes up, pressure goes down. All the time you see that is because there is an effective triggering. Now this is another example, but basically what it shows here, again you've got flow there, so you can see the flow goes up, the pressure goes down, and the patient would like to breathe by missing a breath. But what, the reason why I'm illustrating that is because what is the most common cause of, it, of um, uh, asynchrony in terms of ineffective breathing? You can see that every time, or most of the time, that there is a missed effort here, the tidal volume of the preceding breath is higher, and the expiratory time is shorter. So essentially, they are developing autopeep. So the, the, the patient needs more time to exhale. And the fact that it doesn't manage to do so, then the next breath is more difficult. So let's see a little bit more in detail. So this is flow, and this is pressure, and esophageal. Now here, the green line is when the patient starts to breathe in. And this uh, sort of red line is when the ventilator delivers the flow. Now you can see the difference in time here it will tell us that the patient has first of all to overcome six centimeters of water before the flow can reverse from inspiration, sorry, from expiration to inspiration. So this is an additional elastic load that the patient has to overcome. And whereas in this case, for example, you've got only one centimeter of water that will lead to a pressure delay. So let's see a little bit more in detail. You can see there. So patient who starts breathing in and has to generate that amount of pressure there, about six centimeters of water, before the flow can go up. So you can see there we've got the start of the effort there and then the start of the insufflation over there. And so that is all due to the intrinsic peak. And you can see as the PEEP will accumulate, the patient will waste a lot of efforts. And so what you can see on the ventilator, obviously you won't see that unless you've got an esophageal balloon, but what you can see is a pressure drop and the flow tries to increase. So it's not linear down to zero. So how do we measure uh, intrinsic PEEP? It's very difficult in spontaneously ventilating patients. But essentially, it's very common to see in patients who are mechanically ventilated, the flow doesn't go up to zero. And you can see, if you do an expiratory hold maneuver, you can measure it. So in this patient, for example, had 20 centimeters of water PEEP against the five centimeters of water of set PEEP. So let's have a look at some more waveforms. So what do you think, okay, <laughs> I um, put this title over there. So what you can see here, that the first of all, you can see that there is a decrease in pressure there, okay? This is the amount of effort the patient is making. And it's making so much effort, then this is a missed breath. You can see pressure goes down, flow goes up, but there is no breath. And here what we've done, we've just the trigger sensitivity. So now from this amount of pressure going down, it's only very little. So the trigger, the trigger sensitivity is important, has to be as low as possible, but not low enough to cause auto-triggering. We'll talk about auto-triggering in a second. So this is what happens, you can see there. So if you see something that looks like an atrial flutter of the respiratory rate, that usually is essentially, or a wankerback type, uh, you can see that usually is a missed attempt, uh, missed triggering. So you can see over there, and then it's normalized, the trigger, and then here you've got your respiratory rate. So beware, sometimes at the bedside, you give a lot, a lot of pressure support, and the respiratory rate is 16. You decrease the pressure support, the respiratory rate goes to 24. So you think the patient is having a lot of efforts. Actually, what we are doing sometimes is to reduce the amount of missed efforts and have better synchrony, and that is closer to the neural respiratory rate. And the reason why I'm saying that is because this study shows that if you give a lot of pressure support, lot of pressure support means a lot of tidal volume, means it needs more time to exhale, and that means that in the short period of time during exhalation, uh, it can generate auto peep. So if you decrease the pressure support from there, baseline to what they consider to be optimal, you can see the asynchrony goes down. And at the same time, if you decrease the inspiratory time, which is another way of reducing the tidal volume, again, the uh, asynchrony goes down. And you can see here, this is in graphical form, 
from a pressure support 10 to a pressure support 5, you can see that the number of missed attempts or missed uh, breathing goes down. So what can we do about um, uh, ineffective efforts? We can decrease the intrinsic PEEP. How do we do that? We can lower the tidal volume, lower pressure support, particularly in COPD, lengthen the expiratory time or decrease the inspiratory time, decrease the resistance. How are we going to do it? Change the tube. If it's a size 5 tube, I'm just joking, if it's a small tube or a long tube, you know that most of the effort is going to be spent uh, uh, to reduce the resistance. Bronchodilators. Assess the respiratory drive. So patients who are over-sedated, the respiratory drive is low, so they won't be able to trigger as much as someone with the, uh, with the optimized sedation. Increase external PEEP. That's quite important. Seems counterintuitive, increasing PEEP in someone who's got already intrinsic PEEP. But actually what you need to do is give the airways, uh, open the airways to allow flow to continue and empty the airway and just assess the trigger sensitivity. So, sorry, this one is a bit... Okay, let's go and look at this other one. So this is double triggering. You can see, how many people have seen that? I've seen loads. How many, how many times? Yeah, you can see that very often. So you can see this. This is a flow, then double flow or double pressure, and then go back to normal. We'll see why that happens. Most of the time, you can see here, this is the uh, esophageal pressure there and there. You can see these are very small, and these are big breaths. So they last for a long period of time. They last so long that essentially the ventilator releases pressure, then goes into expiration, but the patient is still breathing in, and therefore is triggering again. So when you see that, there is an issue with the timing. Uh, or um, we'll talk about timing a little bit more. So you can see here, this is a different type. It's called auto-triggering. Now, stay with me one second. On the left-hand side, all you can see this little atrial fibrillation there, which looks a little bit more marked. But this time, the pressure, instead of going down, like in the ineffective trigger, goes up. So it tells you that it's not an effective trigger. And then you can see these two breaths. They look very different. Do you agree? So one uh, has the no negative pressure there, and one has got negative pressure there. If there is a negative pressure, this is a properly patient-triggered. This is an auto-triggered breath. So it's the ventilator receiving some noise, and then it starts triggering a breath, whether the patient likes it or not. What do you think that noise is? Sorry? Yes, very good. So, so we've got something here. So you can see this goes at the rate um, of... You can see something happens there. And you can see, essentially, this is the rate of cardiac oscillations. So this, and you can see they're very much the same as the heart rate. So this has been described initially in uh, uh, organ donors patients, and then they were enough to trigger the ventilator. The same thing you can see here. This is uh, cardiac oscillations, and you can remove them. What about this one? What do you think here? What do you think is auto-triggering <coughs> this uh, ventilator? Now, we'll do something in the next screen. And um, you can see this problem slightly will uh, improve. We've done nothing to the patient. <coughs> How many people have got wet, wet tubes? So this is condensation. And essentially, once you clear the tube, then the respiratory waveform goes back to normal, and the auto-trigger uh, stops from happening. OK. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this one, although it's quite interesting, because how many times have you seen this kind of asynchrony? Physiotherapy loved them. It's full of secretions. And essentially, once you clear the chest, you see all this auto-triggering all goes. Um, I will let the, the slide finish, just because it took me 10 minutes to do it. So <laughs> might as well make the most of it. Okay. 
And you can see here how it's cleared by just clearing the chest. And this is when the face of the physiotherapist comes to you really smiling and is really interesting. So we've done the, f <laughs> yes, I've got a few over there. So flow is synchrony. So we've done the initial part, the triggering. Now the flow, this is when the flow is delivered. Now this is clearly a, a, a volume controlled um, breath. You can see with uh, a flat or, or constant flow. And you can see this one, and it's different from this one. So this one is, goes down. So the pressure is pulled down. It's because the, pay, the, the flow is not sufficient. This is the time. How many people use volume control or volume assist? Uh, not many people, but this is, illustrates the point, which I will show later on into a pressure support mode, how this flow is insufficient and it pulls the pressure down. So this is flow starvation. And you can see that you've got various degree of flow starvation. You go from normal to a little bit, much more, and much, much more. Okay, and w the only thing you can do, if you can see from there, is the pull in uh, pressure. Uh, increase the flow if you're in volume control and that is improved. Now there's something happening here, it's flow is synchrony. How many people have seen this? I've seen a couple last week which I haven't seen for a little while but what do you think that is? Will that help say? This is periodic breathing. So this is for patients who you over support, they are really over supported, large tidal volumes and they basically breathe a little and then they need a little rest, and then they breathe again, and they have a little rest. So that is the time when you reduce the sedation, you reduce the pressure support, and try to get the respiratory rate back to normal. Now, cycling. Cycling is an interesting one. Um, it's not something done in Lycra, by the way. It's a just basically look at premature and delayed. We'll have a look. So are you you're familiar with this pressure support breaths? So what happens is the ventilator has got an inspiratory triggers, you know, but also an expiratory one. This expiratory one in pressure support is flow. So you can see that that is the peak in, uh, inspiratory flow. And you can see here that the cycling is a proportion of the inspiratory versus the peak, so divided by the peak. So in this case, for example, the peak is 80, this flow is 20, so there is a 25% uh, cycling off uh, criterion. Does it make sense? So you can make the inspiratory time shorter by making this criterion going uh, towards your left hand side, so closer to the peak expiratory flow, or you can make the inspiratory time longer by just moving the cycling off criteria towards your right, so away from the peak expiratory flow. So away, again, one of my drawings, I'm afraid. So you can see that one, that three, three breaths on press support, and these are the neural drive, so the neural time. So the neural time is fixed, but you can see breath number one, there's a perfect match, the uh, breath and the neural time are exactly the same. This is an early cycling, so the ventilator stops early before the neural time. And this is a late cycling, is the neural time happens before, so the patient would like to breathe out, but we still insufflate. And so you can see here, this is the criteria is 25, this is 40, so early, and this is too late, it's 10%. So, so this is good match, early and late. So why is that important? Just have a look at this one. So you can see the, the, this is again the esophageal pressure. This is the gastric, but ignore that for now. This is the airway pressure and the flow. You can see that as the uh, flow goes into expiration, the patient will st still wants to breathe. So the flow goes down and then up again. So you can see that notch. Uh, and you can see the patient trying to breathe a bit longer than what the ventilator might want. And you can see if it's extreme, then you go, can go into double uh, triggering again. Do you remember I spoke about double triggering earlier? So the inspiratory time, the neural time is so long that you get two breaths for in one uh, neural time. And if you were to use this mechanism, this is what Nick was talking about earlier, it's essentially is the EMG electromyogram. You can see that the patient wants to breathe at that time, whereas the ventilator, sorry, wants to breathe out at that time, the ventilator is still inspiring. So this is a delayed cycling. 
Now, how can you recognize delayed cycling at the bedside? You can see, look at the pressure waveform. Normally, you'll see this little beak going up. And this is when the patient is stopping insufflation and try to push out and just breathe out. And you've got an increase in airway pressure. Hopefully, it would be a little bit clearer there. You can see there, instead of being smooth like that, it goes up. And you can see this little notch on the floor. And actually, by seeing the patient, you can see the patient is breathing out. Use of the accessory muscles, the abdomen becomes a bit more tense. And this is just one more example, um, which is very common. It's probably one of the most common ones I've seen recently, at least in my unit. So what, why is that important, delay time? Because if you delay cycling, then the expiratory time goes down, the lung emptying goes down, so there is increased volume. Increased volume creates intrinsic PEEP, which leads to delay in triggering, non-triggering breaths, and certainly will increase enormously the workload. And essentially, this is a, um, is a um, vicious circle. But it depends on the patient. So the patient, look at the left-hand side, you've got a patient with a time, sorry, long time constant. So this is a patient who takes a long time to deflate. So they want short inspiratory time, a much longer expiratory time. And contrast it with the ARDS, with a short time constant, rapid filling and rapid emptying. Now, look on the left-hand side. What happens is, if you delay the, the uh, cycling off, so essentially the inspiratory time is very long, what happens? Look, missed breaths. So the intrinsic peep accumulate to the point that they can't really trigger. And if you make it longer and longer and longer, you can see that this will normalize. So this is normal. But if you go into the ARDS and you make it longer, then th the inspiratory time is far too long uh, and they get double triggered. So if you make it shorter, the inspiratory time is too short and they'll create double triggering over there. So this is a marathon through a, um, asynchronies. So I'm going to give you my conclusions and I think are going to be four points. One, watch the patient closely. You might not need a lot of sophisticated invasive analysis if you can see them. Just use the graphics. They are there on the ventilator. Spend some time looking at that and observe the ventilation waveform. Now think about when the patient is uncomfortable, adjusting the mode of the ventilation or the settings is far more effective than adjusting sedation. And frequent asynchrony negatively impact on patient outcome. So this is a classic style. Uh, who is watching the patient? And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Luigi. Any questions?